Hello, my name is Rob Evans, and I'm the School Security Liaison Officer for Vermont's Agency of Education and Department of Public Safety. In my work in schools across the state, I've heard from a variety of sources that schools are in need of some de-escalation and prevention of violence training for their administrative staff and faculty members. This training is designed to provide you with a snapshot of some of the knowledge, skills, and abilities that can be used to keep you safe when dealing with an agitated subject or a potentially violent situation. I am pleased to introduce Mr. Morning Fox, who is the Director of Mental Health Services for the State of Vermont. In his spare time, Fox is also the lead trainer for Caldera Associates. Fox has helped train sheriffs around the state for supervision and transportation of involuntary psychiatric patients, as well as the vetting and training of qualified mental health professionals throughout the state. He is a member of the Team 2, team two Steering Committee and was one of the original trainers and developers of the Team 2 training model, which is a collaboration between law enforcement and community mental health providers. Prior to working with the Division of Mental Health, Fox was the Director of Behavioral Health for Lamoille County Mental Health, overseeing their adult mental health services. Fox has also been the Director of several maximum security inpatient psychiatric units in the state of Massachusetts. He started his career at the Howard Center as a crisis clinician and later was the Assistant Crisis Bed Program Director. Fox has also trained with the FBI in hostage negotiation, has attended the Police Academy, and has been a trainer for the Non-Abusive Psychological and Physical Intervention Program, the Crisis Prevention Intervention Program, and the Mental Health First Aid. Fox has provided violence prevention and de-escalation trainings to businesses and law enforcement agencies throughout New England, and I'm so thankful for Fox to be here to provide this important training. So Fox, thanks again for being here and providing this inf important information. Thanks, Rob. I uh, appreciate the opportunity for being able to be here and presenting uh, this information. This is information that's very dear to me. Uh, I've performed countless trainings uh, and educational sessions on this type of material. I find it to be incredibly useful uh, and incredibly needed. Uh, and I always like to let folks know, too, that the information that we talk about today is not just for professionals but this can be used in your daily life, can be used in talking with your wife, with the person at the gas station, uh, or someone at the, at the bank, if, if you will. Uh, I also just like to say uh, as well that what we'll be going over today, I will try to encompass uh, the full breadth of, of, a, uh, of a full training, but we're really going to try and just hit the high notes. Uh, today we'll be doing kind of what I describe as the Reader's Digest version of the Cliff Notes version of, of the training. Uh, so with that, let's just move forward. Um, so de-escalation and violence prevention. The first question that, that we need to be able to ask is why are people violent or why do people engage in violent, assaultive, destructive acts? Uh, and, and really, uh, the quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, sums it up uh, very well. Violence is the language of the unheard. Uh, Typically, people resort to acts of aggression, of violence, when they don't feel that they're being heard, that they're unable to get their message across verbally, or don't have the skills to do it. For some folks, it's a protective measure. Uh, becoming assaultive or violent creates physical space so that they feel more protected. Like I mentioned before, it gives them a voice uh, when they don't feel that their actual verbal skills are getting the message across. Uh, for some folks, uh, uh, they actually the use of violence is a, uh, a particular technique uh, to try and control or dominate uh, other folks, uh, and you'll see that in cases of uh, uh, domestic assault and domestic violence as well. Uh, and so there are a lot of reasons why, but for me the focus really is uh, the lack of a voice. Uh, so now that we know why some people might uh, become violent, uh, let's take a look at uh, what some of the factors are uh, that might lead someone to be violent or to place them at a higher risk for violence. So as you'll see on the, uh, on the slide, there's a, a number of things listed here. The first thing I want to touch base on is uh, the gender, sex, uh, male. Uh, men tend to be uh, at a higher risk uh, for propensity for violence. Uh, and I ask folks, you know, why do they feel that that might be? And the answers really are multi-layered. We have societal pressures 
the society tells us that uh, men are supposed to be uh, dominant, men are supposed to be controlling and, and running things, uh, so you have that type of thing. But you also have genetics, you have uh, testosterone uh, and, and things of that sort. So there's that genetic predisposition as well. Uh, the other piece that I want to touch on here are both substance abuse and intelligence. Uh, alcohol and stimulants are the, the, uh, the piece that I have listed here next to substance abuse. When you have someone who is actively intoxicated with either alcohol or stimulants, the predictability of their potential for violence skyrockets. Uh, it's really kind of off the charts, and we're really unable to really gauge someone's ability to become violent or not uh, with alcohol or stimulants. Uh, other substances uh, have an impact, but not quite the same. Uh, you hear of people having enraged, you know, the, the angry uh, drunk, if you will, uh, things of that sort. But you don't necessarily hear of the assaultive person for, you know, who's uh, high on heroin or has been smoking a lot of uh, pot uh, in those sense. Those folks will engage in criminal activities to be able to maintain their, their addiction, but not necessarily lead them to, to violence solely based on, on the, uh, the, the substance used. The intelligent piece uh, is, a, is an interesting concept. When we're talking about folks who have lower than average intelligence, uh, why might those folks ha be at a higher risk for uh, being assaulted? And really that, that comes down to uh, the, the issue of verbal skills. When folks do not have the verbal skills to be able to engage in an argument, to, be get, to engage in a dialogue, the frustration level can increase fairly quickly and so in order to get their point across, one might then uh, rely on, uh, on violent behavior or assaulted behavior. Uh, that can be learned from an early age. School bullies picking on uh, uh, the child with the lower intelligence. Uh, how do they respond? Well, they're not going to verbally respond. They may respond to shoving or pushing or even getting into a fight uh, with that school bully. That school bully may have left them alone after that fight. They have learned, oh, this, this worked for me to get out of these tough situations, and so it becomes a learned behavior. Uh, so there are a lot of risk factors why uh, someone might become assaultive, but let's, let's actually take a look uh, a little bit closer on some of these on some predictors of violence. So predictors of violence. The number one predictor of future violence is a past history of violence. Uh, and most of the statistics will show you that uh, if someone has a past history of violence, they're 10 times more likely to become assaultive at some point in the future. You need, do need to take into consideration what type of violence, did they use weapons, has it, was it one time 30 years ago, or, or, or whatnot. But the reality is most of us don't know people's history. So knowing that someone's history increases their, their risk for becoming violent is nice, but it's not really a very useful uh, predictor for us because most of the folks, we just don't know that history. Uh, so let's look at some other predictors. A significant change in behavior. Again, this also relies on having some knowledge of the individual because it's hard to know if this is a change in someone's behavior if you don't know them. If you do know them, you have any kind of experience with them, a change in behavior can be a very significant predictor of, of future violence. And actually, a significant change in behavior is correlated to a 10 times more likely uh, chance of becoming assaultive in the future. The history of violence I mentioned earlier, that 10 times more likely than, say, the normal population, is at some point in the rest of their life. So even if we know that someone has a history, that may not help us for today. But if you see a significant change in behavior, now you're talking that there's a, another 10 times. So 10 times 10 is now 100 times more likely to become assaultive. And now we're talking in the next maybe 12 to 24 hours uh, that someone might become uh, assaulted. It's becoming a bit more helpful, but still that's still a wide window, and again, we may not know the history, we may not know them well enough if there's a change in their behavior. 
the, the final and biggest uh, predictor of, of violence is what's called an increase in gross motor activity. Um, that's when people start to engage their large muscle groups. Someone goes from tapping their fingers on a table to starting to really swing their arms. Uh, a, uh, an example I like to use from my inpatient uh, psychiatric days is that there are folks who we used to describe as having what was called the Thorazine shuffle, uh, where they would walk along, arms kind of straight down at their side without much kind of body movement. And then on some day, all of a sudden, their arms are flailing, they're much more animated. That's an increase in their gross motor activity. That's a significant change in their behavior. If you notice an increase in gross motor activity, now you're talking another 10 times likelihood that someone's going to become assaultive, and we're also talking the next 0 to 60 minutes. So that, that becomes a useful uh, target, a useful piece of information. That is not to say that everyone who's walking around town gesticulating and waving their arms is about to become assaulted. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why someone might be waving their arms around. They might be waving their arms around just to say hi to you from across the street. doesn't mean you have to run, run away from them. Uh, if you know someone's history and you know them well enough that, to see if this is a change in their behavior and you see an increase in gross motor activity, if you do the math, 10 times 10 times 10, we're now at a place of saying this person is a thousand times more likely to become assaultive and we're talking the next zero to sixty minutes. That is very useful information. One caveat I like to put with that is let's remember too the the prevalence of people becoming assaultive is very very small uh, and so a thousand times more likely than a very very small number is still a fairly small number. So I just want to caution folks not to feel and predict that this guy's going to be assaultive because, look, he's waving his arms around. Uh, but these are very important things. You're meeting with someone. They go from tapping their finger or their legs kind of jittery to standing up and having to pace. This should be a red flag for us. So what causes this? What brings someone to the point of, of violence, of assaultive behavior? Well, frankly, it's stress. Uh, stress, uh, the definition of stress is a difficulty that causes worry or emotional tension. So my little friend here on the, on the slide, you'll see my little fox friend sitting there in the middle of all the hounds uh, about to go out for the hunt. That's a stressful situation. Uh, and so stress brings out sometimes good for us, you know, the stress of, uh, of be, becoming ready for a debate or the stress of an exam or uh, some type of athletic event can really kind of sharpen our skills. But also stress can cause us to, to revert back to some more basic instincts uh, for us to uh, resort or, or rely on uh, things other than our verbal skills to try and get out of situations. Uh, luckily my fox friend there stays quiet and moves along hopefully to live another day and probably be chased by hounds for another day. Um, but what's the first step? Well, the first step actually is to look at ourselves. When we start to get to a point where we think we might have to engage with someone who's really upset, what's happening for us? Take our own pulse. Take a step back for that half second. Know what baggage we're bringing in uh, to this circumstance. Uh, there are times when I know when I've come into work uh, that if I've just had a fight with my wife on the, on the way in, it kind of sets my mood for a while, and I may not be the best person to, to engage with a, an upset parent or an upset person directly uh, just because of where my own head is at. And so I need to be aware of the baggage I'm bringing in uh, when I'm about to engage with someone. What we want to do is be able to communicate with folks. <clears throat> we want to make folks feel safe and feel heard. The reason I got into this field, into, into mental health, was that for whatever reason, on a little narcissistic side, I felt that when people engaged with me, they felt heard. And that was why I thought I'd be a good counselor, or a good therapist, was that a huge piece of that is that people just feel heard helps them to feel better. And so when you treat someone with respect and they feel safe and they feel heard, the lines of communication quickly open up uh, so that we're able to engage with them 
figure out what's going on, and hopefully come to a successful and a safe resolution. So let's start talking a little bit about some of the communication techniques. The first thing that people will, will say when they, when they talk about working with someone who's really upset is that you need to talk to them. And I'm here to challenge that and say, actually, we want to listen to them. We don't want to talk so much. We want them to be talking. We want to be listening. One of the things that, that I have learned over many years, both in doing these, this work as well as through uh, my marriage to, well, now my second wife, so I've done it right the second time, uh, is that you don't want to jump into problem solving too quickly. As a man, I will, I will say this uh, for myself, but I think this goes true for, for most folks of the male gender, which is we are problem solvers. We like to fix things. And if we immediately jump to problem solving, the problem is we may try to problem solve the wrong problem. And that's why we need to listen to what's going on. Because the first thing that someone says, the first thing they're upset about or say that they're upset about may not actually be the real issue here, but that's the easiest thing for them to express. And so we need to be able to listen, get them to engage with us so that we can find out what the actual real problem is, what the core is, and then be able to move beyond that. Uh, and so we want to try to avoid problem solving too soon. Use a non-judgmental attitude. Be accepting, uh, things of this sort. These are all very nice and most folks will say, Gee, Fox, no kidding. Uh, the piece that I want to focus on here is uh, that you, we need to respect the values of the person we're talking to. That does not mean you have to agree with their values. I'm just saying you need to respect them. Let me give you an example of this and why it is this is probably one of the more important things if you can take away a general concept from this take away the general concept of respecting the person's values of who you're sitting across from. When I worked at a uh, maximum security uh, inpatient uh, facility in Massachusetts, um, I ha this is a Department of Corrections uh, facility uh, for the criminally insane. We had a inmate there who one day uh, went up to another inmate, made a shank, and stabbed him. Security was, was there, security separated them, took the shank away, all that was good. In talking with this inmate, one of the officers said uh, to him, why did you do that? And he said, because that guy stole my ramen noodles. And the officer said, so you, why did you stab someone over a bag of ramen noodles? That, you know, it's just a bag of ramen noodles. At that, once the officer said that, the inmate then turned and started to assault the officer. What happened here? Well, what happened was this inmate's property was taken. When you're in corrections, you have very few personal belongings. You're told when to get up, when to go to sleep. You're given state-issued clothes, state-issued laundry, linens, etc. If you're lucky enough to have a little bit of money, you have canteen, and you might be able to buy things like ramen noodles, cheese whiz, uh, and Slim Jims. Uh, these are the types of things that, that people have and they become their own personal property. So when this other inmate stole this, this, this guy's ramen noodles, that was his personal property. He had high value of that property as opposed to if that inmate had stolen his pillow, he could go to the officer and say, hey look, I need another pillow because I don't really care because it's not mine, but I need one. But this was his ramen noodles. And so when the officer said, hey, it's just a bag of ramen noodles, what that officer did was he devalued what was important to that inmate. And by devaluing it, we've, we've lost any chance of trying to uh, engage with them to, to have that dialogue. And the result was more assaultive behavior. So I can't stress enough. You don't have to agree with it, but it's important that we accept it uh, and accept their values. So let's, let's now talk about some actual skills of how we can engage someone to gather that information, to find out what the actual problem is, and to keep them engaged in a, in a verbal dialogue uh, 
working our way away from any kind of potential violence. So using some active listening skills. Uh, one of the active listening skills uh, that uh, we use is what's called emotional labeling. The intent of emotional labeling is to be able to reflect back to the person, here's what I'm hearing, here's what I'm seeing uh, based on, on what you're saying. Uh, and so you'll find yourself saying, saying things such as, you know, you seem really angry, or you sound frustrated, you sound sad, uh, those types of things. Uh, and it's okay if you're wrong uh, in those descriptions. They'll correct you, uh, and which gives you more information. But let me also stress, there's a big difference between, wow, you are angry, and wow, you seem angry. You are angry is accusatory. I'm telling you what you are. I can tell you right now, my wife doesn't use emotional labeling. As good as she is, uh, she's a psychiatric nurse, she, she knows these skills too, but when we're at home, she'll say, wow, Fox, you're really anxious this morning. And I get immediately defensive uh, because she's saying to me what I am. And I don't want someone else telling me what I am. I should know it myself, and I'm going to disagree and become angry about that. But if she says, wow, Fox, you seem really anxious this morning, I can say, you're right because I have to go do this presentation. Or, well, actually, no, I'm just a real frustrated that the alarm clock didn't go off when it was supposed to. And it gives me that chance to clarify. Also, by, by presenting emotional labeling like that, sometimes when people are starting to get upset, they don't realize necessarily how they're presenting. Uh, our ability to be rational uh, is, is directly related to our emotional state. Uh, if any of you have ever been outside of a courthouse at any given time, you see the, the, uh, the statue of the late Lady of Justice with the scales of justice. Our ability to be rational is just like that. As our emotional state goes up, our ability to be rational goes down. As our emotions come down, our ability to be rational comes back up. And so as we're very emotional, we'll say and be doing things, we may not realize how we're coming across. And so by saying, wow, Fox, you seem really angry right now, that might trigger me or key me to go, oh, I'm sorry. No, I didn't mean to come across as angry. I was just really passionate about this issue, you know, things of that sort. And so it, it reflects back to the person what's going on for them and gives them the opportunity to do a little self-reflecting as well. Uh, so emotional labeling is an, is an extremely useful uh, technique in that sense. Paraphrasing. Uh, paraphrase is really just, just a summary and kind of a, a, a question summary to, to get some clarification. Uh, so, so are you saying that uh, you're upset because of your grades or, are you, or is really the, the issue here uh, that you're more upset because you're, you're facing uh, suspension? Uh, something of that sort. You know, I've had those types of conversations uh, back in the day when I was a, uh, a special ed teacher. Uh, what paraphrasing does is it allows the person to know, hey, you've actually been listening to me, you're actually engaging with me, um, and you're, you're asking questions to get some clarification. <clears throat> I, I mentioned here on this, on this slide, use the same terminology as, as, as the subject or as the person that you're, that you're talking with. Terminology is an extremely important piece, and this also goes back to uh, the emotional labeling as well. We talk with our senses. You'll notice that some folks will say things like, you know, do you see what I mean? Or someone else might say, do you hear, do you hear what I mean? Do you hear what's going on? Uh, and so they're talking with senses. Do you see? Do you hear? You want to try and use the same sense when you talk back to someone. This is a basal brain uh, response. This is kind of goes back to our lizard brains and, and how we interact with folks and know whether or not we, we can trust someone. It's an unconscious thing. It's not a conscious thing. But in an unconscious way, if the person says to me, do you see what I'm talking about? And I respond by saying, yeah, I see. Their, their internal dialogue, their unconscious dialogue is, you talk the same language as I do. Maybe I can trust you. Whereas if they say to me, Fox, do you see what I'm talking about? And I say, yeah, I hear you. There's a disconnect. It's not a conscious thought. It's not that the person is consciously, consciously saying, gee, Fox doesn't talk my same language. I can't trust him. But there's that disconnect. And our brain kind of registers there's a difference here. And so if you can pick this up, 
It's a, an incredibly useful technique to mirror back to the person, to use that same kind of language and terminology. Reflecting or mirroring. This is probably one of my favorite active listening skills. Uh, I have found this to be incredibly useful with my kids, with my wife, with my boss, and with clients and other consumers that I've worked with in, in various capacities. The idea here is, as someone says something, you really just want to repeat back to them the last two, three, maybe four words, but in the form of a question. Uh, for example, I can't stand the food here. You can't stand the food here? Well, yeah, it's really terrible and, you know, it makes me sick. It makes you sick? Well, I don't get sick. I just, you know, it just tastes bad. So now, I'm, by reflecting and mirroring, I've given the person feedback on what they're saying and I'm prompting them to give me some more information to clarify what's, what's being said. One caveat that I like to bring up here is that it's really important. Um, some of these skills, uh, some of these active lessening techniques, some will be comfortable for you to use, some won't be comfortable for you to use. That's okay. I don't use all of these either. Uh, there are some, like I said, the reflecting and mirroring, I feel very comfortable with and I use a lot. But you don't want to rely on any one skill or technique because uh, I can tell you now, if all I did was reflecting uh, to someone, I'm sure I will have someone yelling at me going, what are you, some kind of parrot? Uh, as they just kind of uh, get upset with the fact that I'm repeating back to them everything they're saying. So, uh, again, it's very useful, but just don't rely on it uh, as, as your sole uh, form of gathering more information and building that rapport with someone. The use of silence. Silence or effective pauses, um, we don't like them, to be very blunt. Uh, there was a research study that came out uh, in the early 2000s uh, of people in North America, United States and Canada, uh, which showed that we can tolerate about 12 seconds of silence in any uh, conversation before we start to get uncomfortable. And so you can use that to your advantage. Again, going back to the 80-20, wanting the person to be talking more than I am, if there have been questions asked or there's a pause in the dialogue, sit with it. Even count in your head to 12, because I'll tell you, 12 seconds seems like a really long time when you're counting it, but it is only 12 seconds. And when you use that to your advantage, the, you wait that silence. As uncomfortable as you might be, so is the other person sitting across from you. And my guess is, in most cases, they're going to want to fill that silence. And what that does for us is that gives us more information, that gives us more uh, points to, to uh, clarify with them and take the time uh, to, to listen and gather more, more information. Because the ultimate goal of all of this is to try and help someone's, to someone to change their behavior. We don't necessarily care about changing a person. We're just looking at changing their behavior. We're looking at getting someone from their angry, emotional state to a calmer, more rational state. And so by using these techniques, taking some time to engage in conversation will help give that time to let the adrenaline dump slowly get out of their system, let that emotional mind settle a little bit so you can have more of a rational conversation with folks. And so using that silence to your advantage is a, is a great technique to, to, uh, towards getting to that goal. Open-ended questions. These are all the questions that cannot be answered by yes or no. Uh, the first question I like to tell people to never ask is, are you okay? Um, if I ask you what's the answer to are you okay, there really are only two answers. Are you okay? Yes. Or are you okay? No. And I can tell you right now, I don't think that there's anyone out there that's ever asked someone, are you okay, if we actually thought they were okay. You know, when someone's doing fine, we don't ask, are you okay? We've already made a decision, I don't think you're okay. That's why we asked it. Are you okay is a yes or no question, and it, it begs and, and forces me to then have a follow-up question to the either yes or no answer. So my, the thing I put out there is to say, don't ask, are you okay? You already assume they're not okay. So start with something that's open-ended that will give you more information. Hey, what's going on? 
I, you seem angry to me, going back to an emotional lab labeling. But asking those questions, uh, you know, of what's going on? Um, you know, where did this first occur? Um, you know, wh when did that happen? Uh, how did we get here? Uh, those types of questions will gather more information. The questions that start with the word why, those are open-ended, but I just want to tell people to be careful with the questions that start with why, because why questions can come across as, as quite accusatory. Why did you do that? Can immediately put someone on the defensive, and, and so you want to try to be careful with, with how you phrase a why question. Not that you can't, but I just, I just caution folks that why questions can come across as uh, quite accusatory. Uh, again, this gets them talking, this keeps them going, and this provides us with more, more information uh, to better uh, try to de-escalate someone. iMessages. I mentioned earlier that I don't use every active listening technique. I think iMessages are the, the one technique that I, ha I have the hardest time uh, using. Uh, my wife, on the other hand, uh, again, I, I like to talk about uh, my wife frequently in my, in my trainings. She's a psychiatric nurse and has run inpatient uh, treatment facilities for uh, uh, adolescents. And she uses eye messages it like it's like gold and it just rolls off her tongue. I can't do it. It's it just, for me, it feels a little too rote. Um, but uh, let, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about with eye messages. Um, there's a formula for an eye message. Uh, it's, I feel some emotion when you, their behavior, because this is my reason I want something to change and I would like you to do this. Uh, in other words, I feel frustrated when you yell at me uh, because it's hard for me to talk with you and I would like you to talk with me so we can resolve this or something of that nature. Uh, when you use those kind of I, I message statements, I'm not saying you make me frustrated or you make me something else. I'm saying I own my emotion, you know, I feel frustrated when you yell, and then for me, I want to try and make it to something that I think the person might actually have some buy into. And usually it's their own stuff. They want their needs met. And so I'm going to tweak it to that. I feel frustrated when you yell because I want to be able to help and I don't want to miss anything. And so I'd like, to, I'd like for you to talk with me over here. You know, something of that sort. And usually I'll gesture over to a chair or to, a, to another area than where we are currently. Uh, and for the most part, I almost always try to gesture to having a sit-down conversation. You know, so I'd like, you to, so I'd like to talk with you so we can resolve this and, and kind of motion to, to the chairs. And why do I do that? Two things. If I were to tell them, and I'd like, to talk, I'd like you to talk to me more respectfully, well, anyone who's a parent... Uh, will tell you that, you know, what does that look like? Our children are going to have a very different op opinion about, oh, I was being respectful to you, and I'll say, no, I didn't think you were. And we'll have that debate, you know, because we all have our own uh, interpretation of what that might look like. Same thing happens when I say, you know, the music's too loud, and I yell up, hey, turn the music down, and then a few minutes later, the music's still loud, and I yell, I said, turn the music down, and they said, I did, and it's because they went from 10 to 9, and I was really thinking, no, I wanted it around three. You know, there was no, nothing clear in that sense. So for me, I want to say, I feel frustrated when you yell because it's hard for me to, to talk with you and I want to make sure I get everything you're saying. And so please talk with me over here. I'm trying to engage them in a conversation. I'm trying to get them to think about sitting down in a conversation. Because in this country, we do have the societal norm that when two people are sitting in a chair, in chairs of, across from each other, they're engaged in a conversation. And conversations have a general feel for what the dialogue is like, what the volume is like, what the tone is like. And so we're trying to cue them into, into doing that. So that's why I'll try to say, and I'd like you to sit over here or come over here, as opposed to talk quieter or be more respectful or something of that sort. Um, I try to engage them in, in some movement uh, that will help uh, engage them in, in this activity further. Again, that verbal activity. And in that end, that, that ask, if you will, of that, uh, of that when, I, when I feel frustrated and, and all those types of things in the, in the I message, 
the, and I want you to X, Y, and Z, needs to be clear, observable, and reasonable. You know, that's why, and I want you to turn it down, isn't clear. It's not observable. Or I want you to turn it down to one, may not be reasonable. And so you want things to be clear, observable, and reasonable. Another important piece uh, to talk about beyond just the active listening skills to engage someone is creating an alliance. And by using a lot of these active listening skills, you will be inherently creating an alliance with the person that you're talking to. When people feel allied or people feel that they're being treated with respect, with, with, with respect it's almost impossible for our brains to tell us to become assaultive towards someone that we feel is treating us with respect. It's how our brain works, it's a protective mechanism, but it's really very difficult for someone to start to become aggressive, violent, assaultive, dangerous, any of the terms you want to use uh, for these types of behaviors when someone feels that they're, they're being treated with respect and especially if they feel that they've actually created some kind of alliance uh, with someone. Um, so to use we as much as possible is a, is a great way. We're going to resolve this. We will come to a resolution here. We can work through this. Uh, I, I caution folks about saying I can help you fix this because you, you don't want to set up a dynamic of the person is only going to work with you and won't engage with any of the other administrators in the building, any of the other teachers in the, in the building, any of the other staff or anything of that sort, that they'll only work with you. Uh, and if you're not around, well, then hell's going to break loose. You don't want to try and set up that kind of dynamic. And so I always encourage folks to use things like, we'll be able to work through this. It's both a we, you, and the person, but the greater we, we as an agency, we as a school, we as a, a, a department, as a district, et cetera. Uh, so using that, that type of language is really important. Uh, so I've been talking about language a lot and how important language is. I, I do want to get on to talking about some things that aren't language, uh, nonverbal communication. Depending on who you talk to and depending on, on the, the research, people say anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of our communication is nonverbal. I say it's up in those higher ranges. The reason I say that is if you were to watch a movie and hit mute, you can watch it for a while and you'll have the basic idea of what's going on based on how people are moving. You can tell if some people are in a relationship, look, they held hands, they smiled at each other. You can tell when people don't like each other, they're you know, raising a fist at each other, they're pointing, their, their you know, brow is furred, you know, all those types of things. So we, we gather a lot from uh, nonverbal communication. You know, someone's posture, just the clothes they're wearing, their gestures, are they making eye contact, all those types of things uh, communicate to us uh, how the person is doing, where they might be going, uh, and, and uh, uh, so we need to pay attention to those nonverbal skills. Uh, but beyond that, something that people don't talk about too often uh, is something that's important too, which is called paralinguistics. Uh, don't get hung up in the term, but basically that's how we say what we say. There's a, a big difference between um, I want your help and I want your help. I want your help. I want your help. You know, and you can say it a million different ways, but how you say something clearly uh, expresses so much more than just the words that you're saying. Uh, it could be even as simple as you know the the most difficult words that that come up in a relationship. I love you. Um, can be said a myriad of different ways. I love you. I love you. I love you. Uh, you know, so there's all these different things of how we say things that that make the meaning of what we say uh, more so than just the words themselves. So again, it's being aware of yourself and your emotional state and how you're saying some of these things has a huge impact on how it's going to be perceived by the other person. A few quick things on what to avoid. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier, closed-ended questions, those questions that end with yes or no uh, type of things, all that's going to do is make you have to ask another question, so I try to avoid those yes or no questions. Clearly, some of these things seem very, very uh, uh, basic, you know, not to engage in name-calling or being judgmental, uh, yelling, demanding, talking too much, uh, all those types of things. 
very clear, but it goes without saying. When we get emotional and we start not being quite as rational, our voices can get raised. We can start to be a little bit judgmental, all those types of things. Uh, I do want to just take a, a brief moment to talk about giving advice. Uh, giving advice can be a, a double-edged sword. Giving advice can be a golden, life-saving, day-saving technique, and it can also uh, send this spiraling down uh, into one of the worst in, uh, interactions you've ever had. Uh, giving advice, if you know the person and you have any kind of prior relationship or have built some kind of an alliance with someone, giving advice can be golden. Hey, look, I know that this has been a tough road. I know you've been dealing with this for a long time. But if I can just give you an advice that if you take this tack with, you know, the superintendent or with the principal, they're not going to hear this message. You know, we need to, you know, we need to talk, you know, yada, yada, and have that kind of an advice giving session. That can be golden. But if you don't have that kind of alliance or that kind of relationship with the person and you go down that road of, you know, look, can I give you some advice? This is what I think you might want to do or should say. You very easily can get a response of, you know, basically, who are you who don't know me and my circumstance to be giving me advice? You know, that's awfully presumptuous of you uh, to, to think you know what's best for me. Um, and that can really uh, put major roadblocks in, in, uh, uh, in any any road down towards building that alliance and building that rapport so that you can influence someone's behavior so that you can get to that positive resolution. So let's say things have become escalated and you're trying to use some of these active listening skills but you also just have you're not able to just get break through some of the anger or the escalation of someone. So let's talk about a few uh, techniques uh, to try and help de-escalate and bring that emotional mind down for someone. Validating the feelings. Uh, this is an important piece and I use it all the time and it's the kind of thing where someone will say, well I understand how frustrating this, this is for you or, or that must be really difficult. Uh, there's a big difference there. That must be really difficult. I can only imagine how tough that is for you are great things to say. We want to say, and it's a natural thing for us to say, is, you know, I understand how terrible this is. The reality is we don't. We have a good idea, you know, how tough this is. We may have had a similar circumstance in our own life at some point, but we're not that person. We don't live their life. We don't have their same genetics, their same life, all those different things. So we truly don't understand how this is frustrating for them or how this is impactful for them. And so you want to avoid saying, I understand what you're going through kind of thing, because you'll easily get you don't understand. How do you know? You don't know the, you know, kind of the newer way of saying it. You don't know me uh, kind of things. Um, and so instead of I understand that this is frustrating or I understand this is difficult, to just say I can only imagine. Or even better yet, one of the things I, I will do with folks, help me to understand how frustrating this is for you. Because by saying help me to understand how frustrating or how difficult or whatever, I'm now giving them some of my ego strength and I'm putting them in the position of teacher. I'm putting them in the position of you have information you can provide to me. So I'm switching roles because during a lot of this conversation, no matter how we play it out, there's a power differential. I have some power over something. That's why they're upset with me, some decision I've made or some decision that we've made as a, as a school or as an entity. And so uh, to say I understand we don't, but to, to say, help me to understand, that gives them the ability and the chance to actually do some education and to actually go, wow, I, I actually have some control here. Um, that, that's a huge turnaround for them. It changes that power differential. Matching the intensity of volume. A lot of folks who were trained when they go through social work school and things of that sort that you always need to keep kind of a calm voice, you know, even keel, those types of things. But I'm here to kind of debunk that, that if someone is yelling at you uh, and you were to say to them, well, gee, I'm really sorry that, you know, this is upsetting for you and please help me to understand, you know, that's, that's antagonizing. People are going to get really upset. I learned at an early age the best way to piss my mom off was uh, when uh, she got mad at me for, say, breaking something in the house, and I would just say to her, 
gee, mother, I'm really sorry that that upset you, and I'm trying desperately not to do that, she got more pissed at me because, uh, you know, she, you know, felt that I was being sarcastic, felt that I was being, you know, um, all these types of things. And that's how that will be perceived to folks. Um, and so what I'm telling folks is not that you have, you should yell at people, but there are times when you do need to match their intensity and volume uh, of things. Um, so we had, there's another brain piece here that I just want to talk about. When, when we're in, we want to uh, match the volume of our surroundings. We always do. Uh, if you're at a restaurant uh, early on, say four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, got out of work early and you're uh, having some appetizers with a colleague uh, and it's quiet and you're talking, having a conversation. An hour later, the evening rush has come in and the place is now packed and it's really loud. Now you find yourself talking to the person next to you with a much louder voice because you're just doing this just so you can hear yourself so your intensity, your volume gets increased. And so you'll also find yourself in that same restaurant when it, you have those pregnant pauses, that little bit of silence, and all of a sudden you hear yourself yelling, and you go, and Aunt Mary, and you're like, oh, sorry, you know, I didn't realize I was yelling. Uh, and so a way to try and create that dynamic is if someone is, is yelling, someone is, their volume is increased, to match that intensity of their volume ever, ever, ever so briefly, and then you quickly, quickly bring down your volume and intensity. And the tendency, the way our brain works, is that we will then follow that. We'll stay with the intensity of our surroundings. Then as our surroundings get quieter, we'll get quieter. And so that quick, excuse me, but when you're yelling, I have a hard time hearing you, and I would like to be able to discuss this further, has that impact. You meet their intensity for that brief second, it, ca it gets their, their attention, uh, and it also, again, creates that external volume that they can then match and mirror as you decrease your volume, they will tend to do that as well. And it will help bring down the emotionality of the person that you're talking with. Derailments. Derailments are basically the kind of thing where when people kind of get themselves like a whirling dervish, you know, they're just kind of going in circles and they're just kind of getting themselves more and more worked up. Sometimes it's, it's just uh, trying to say something that, that kind of breaks that cycle. It could be as easy as, you know, someone is yelling, you know, this is terrible, I can't believe this has happened today, and you just quickly just ask, hey, were the roads okay when you got here? And they'll stop and go, wait, what? And you go, I'm sorry, never mind, I, I got distracted. So what were we talking about again? And you bring it right back. But you, the goal is to try and just kind of shock them, just gently nudge them in some way by saying something that's kind of your non sequitur that makes them go, I'm sorry, what? Take to take a second. And then now you have that, that opening. You've broken that cycle. You can apologize for the non sequitur. Uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted by the weather. Um, but hey, this is important. Let's talk about this over here. I hear, you know, and, and you've, you've now derailed them and, you, and you're able to bring them back onto the tracks, if you will. Um, and so there are different ways of doing kind of those derailments, but trying to just knock them off track just for that brief second. And the last technique uh, that, that folks use uh, is uh, reflective statements. Uh, you know, Mr. Jones, I notice that you're pacing a lot, uh, or I notice that you're, you know, wringing your hands, uh, just kind of noticing different physical aspects of a person. You know, your feet are I notice that your face is awfully red, and that cues them Again, sort of to an emo similar to emotional labeling that cues them to what's going on for them. Oh, my face is red. Well, I get that way when I'm really anxious. Or, oh, thanks. Yeah, I forgot to take my blood pressure medicine this morning. You know, and, and they're able to describe it that way. But it cues them to what's going on for them so that they can kind of take note of it and be able to then explain to you what's going on for them. So, again, you're able to engage and move further down that road. Um, Fox... Couple, couple of quick questions for you. So, yeah. for the for the administrative folks that are at the front desk, the front lines of, of the daily contacts that are happening in the schools, mm -hmm. I, most of the times they're going to know people uh, that are coming in and out. And today's the day where Mr. Johnson comes in and can visibly see that he is upset. And it's to the point where some of these techniques 
are not working, and it's just sure. not a very good feeling for people. Sure. When is it okay for them to break contact? When is it okay, and how do you do that to either go get assistance or to draw somebody else's attention to the conversation that we're not feeling comfortable? And also, how how do they physically control um, their emotions to do some of these things? Is it deep breathing? Is it taking a step back? What's the distance between the individuals? Right. Um, body language? What are the techniques that they they can do to settle themselves down to do some of this stuff? For sure. Uh, great questions, Rob. Uh, the the time the determining time as to uh, this isn't working or this needs to be passed on to you know someone else or something of that sort that's going to be an individual determination different people have different comfort levels uh, depending on their experience their own personal makeup etc um, any and all of these techniques can be used and there, there's no guarantees that any of this is going to resolve resolve it uh, these are just the the skills that have been shown to have the greatest impact uh, in 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 this process uh, so you're right that it's 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 possible that you'll go through this and you still have a very angry Mr. Johnson. Uh, one of the things that I've suggested to other places where I've consulted is having some type of uh, decision tree um, that people are all comfortable with, so that you're kind of consistent with it. That after point X or Y, we decide this gets bumped on to you know this person. Or uh, even having things as uh, I've had some places create uh, code words, if you will, uh, to to help with backup or or getting other folks around. Uh, it may be as simple as, well, let me, you know, you're talking to Mr. Johnson. Well, let me get so and so involved. You pick up the phone, and the particular words you use lets them know that they're actually dealing with a you know a potentially you know volatile situation, and they're able to respond appropriately with either individually or with other other folks. I'm also a big, big supporter of using our, our physical movements, you know, the nonverbal communications, uh, s creating extra space, uh, creating uh, space between folks uh, is an important piece. Uh, folks have asked me a number of times in different, different formats, uh, if there's no desk, there's no uh, uh, kind of, you know, window or anything of that sort, and we're just kind of out in the open, how close, how far should I be from someone? Uh, you know, I think personal space, I think most people consider personal space, you know, our own personal bubble is that one and a half to three foot personal bubble. But what I like to talk about is from a safety perspective, I want to not only be outside of that personal bubble so that someone doesn't feel like I'm invading their space, but also I want to make sure I'm in a space physically that if they did become assaultive, I know I'm physically in a space that... I've got some space to, to so I won't get hit. Um, and so some folks will say, well, that should be, you know, an arm's length away. Uh, well, I know you can't see me, but I'm a five foot three on my on a good day uh, person. And uh, and Rob, you're not. Uh, you're easily over six foot. And so I would say that, you know, I would not only you know when you talk arm's length, not my arm's length, but maybe yours. But also, I, I remind people, people kick. And our legs are longer than our arms, and so I take those extra extra steps, if you will. Um, and so, keeping that distance, and also if you find yourself closer, you know, if the conversation started out more amicably and has started to kind of spiral downward, if you will, to start taking that step or two back, creating that safe space for you, but it also creates that safe space for that person uh, that they have their their personal space. But again, that also can be kind of reflective to the person that they see you backing up. It may trigger them to say, I, you seem like you're scared or nervous. I'm not going to hurt. And it cues them to how, how upset they might be. Um, so I would use all those types of things. Um, it's, it's really important that um, I think you have a unified decision tree, a planning, uh, so that you have kind of a consistent uh, response to these type of uh, circumstances. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's that's kind of how I would go down that road. Did I answer? You did, Fox. And, and one other thing, these are skill sets that can be used not just in person, but also on the phone. So oh, yeah. that if there are if there are things and situations that can be de-escalated on the phone before they get to sure. the in-person contact. 
those are the same types of skills that can be used on the phone for folks as well, correct? And these are these are all, all these all these uh, skills, all these techniques uh, are translatable to uh, to on the phone. You may not be able to say, "I noticed that you're pacing." Um, and uh, you know those those types of, of things you won't be able to read their body language if you will so in, in an essence that phone conversation is a bit trickier uh, you know as the growth you know over the last 10 or 15 years of text messages has come out uh, it becomes even harder uh, you know you, you can't read the emotion behind the words and so it's hard to tell was that sarcastic or was that an honest yes right. um, you know so you know each le each level we lose a little bit of being able to read read that response um, so yeah these these are good and you know and then it's you know how do you terminate uh, a conversation uh, and I think the important piece is to to terminate it with an op with an opening to be able to re-engage and and with a respectful termination of I'm trying to help this doesn't seem to be helping um, and you know to, to actually say I'm going to be terminating this call or I'm gonna be hanging up now or you know if if we can't get past this piece um, then I, I will have to be hanging up because uh, I have not only your concerns but other people's concerns uh, that I have to work with you're more than welcome to can call back to come in to write a letter to have a meeting any of those things but at this point I'm having to end this end this conversation and having some type of uh, ending uh, uh, termination I've actually consulted with one company uh, that actually went so far as to actually write out a uh, an actual phone call termination kind of three sentence piece that all their uh, administrative staff used for kind of those angry callers that's when they get to the point of terminating a call, here's what we're going to say, so that it, you know leaves open for further communication, you know those types of things. Um, so, and Fox, a lot, a lot of these skills, you know, you can't just go through this and then anticipate that um, that they're going to work. These are practiced skills, and some of these skill sets, some folks that are in these positions just just may not have it. You know, all of us can't possess these skills that are going to be able to de-escalate these situations. But what we do know in most of our workspaces is there are people that are extremely good communicators yeah. that no matter what um, those are the folks that we want to bring in so if there are opportunities during those very difficult conversations to bring those people in that have this right. capacity and capability we know we all know in our office spaces and in our workspaces those folks that are just anybody can talk to yeah. them and that's you're exactly right Rob uh, you know knowing you know your champions, if you will, within your own agency, department, facility, uh, those people that are the, the that resource, you know, knowing that, you know, Rob's really good at, the, you know, try and get Rob involved, you know, can someone find Rob, you know, that kind of thing is really important. But also to know that there are resources for support around uh, developing these skills, practicing these skills, uh, or even in, in the event of during an actual crisis, if you will, there are places all around the state uh, where there are uh, professionals that can can do outreach and can help out. Um, every every area in this state is covered by uh, a designated agency. There are ten uh, community mental health centers uh, throughout the state that pretty much cover every county. Uh, uh, that do cover every county of the state of Vermont. And within each of those designated agencies, they have uh, emergency service programs and mobile crisis teams where people can go out uh, into the community, to people's homes, to businesses, to schools, uh, to help with crisis situations, um, uh, helping to de-escalate, or to, to help consult with folks around uh, uh, helping to develop those skills for staff that that don't feel so comfortable with those skills. Uh, so there, there are a lot of resources beyond yourself, myself, uh, uh, within uh, the communities of, of everyone out there. Well, Fox, again, I just want to appreciate, uh, say again, how much I appreciate you being involved with this. Certainly, this is something that is, is, is very important to the folks that are on the front lines. Mm -hmm. And I think this gives them a, a, a good snapshot, a 30,000 foot view yeah. of, of the resources and, and of some of the very basic skill sets that normally all of us are using every day right. and it's just honing in on what those skills are and identifying them and then putting them into place um, if needed in a specific situation so again sir I really appreciate it and if folks have any questions please feel free to reach out to to Fox by email and uh, and thank you very much for participating in this training